I'm Jack Ruston. Welcome to the Ruston's Boneyard podcast. We're talking about real food, traditional cooking, nutrition, health and exercise. We're asking whether a more primal approach to life brings us further in line with the biology evolution has given us. We'll be exploring some of these topics with expert guests from the worlds of clinical practice and research. I'm not qualified to give any sort of medical or dietary advice, and nothing in this material should be considered as such. The opinions expressed here are for the purposes of discussion only. Please consult a qualified medical professional before undertaking changes to your diet. And now, on with the show. Welcome back to the Ruston's Boneyard podcast. My guest today is a pillar of the carnivore community. She's a health coach who lost 80 pounds on a carnivore diet and then turned to help others find the same success. She runs a carnivore coaching program, a growing Facebook community, hosts a podcast and a weekly live stream on YouTube and Clubhouse. She's black, she's carnivore, she's at Black Carnivore. Ladies and gentlemen, Ada Fox. Thank you so hey. much for being here today. Thanks for having me. Not at all. Not at all. So, um, listen, to start with, uh, as, as is customary, tell us what brought you to this lifestyle. Well, it really was an evolution. You know, I started with keto like a lot of people. I started in 2015. And um, at that point, I was, uh, you know, I weighed the most I had ever weighed. I felt awful. I was exhausted all the time. And, uh, you know, I, I, I obviously went to it because I wanted to lose weight, but even more important than the aesthetics of it, I really just was exhausted all the time. And I just, you know, it was all I could do to do to get up, go to work and come home and go back to bed. So I knew I wanted more out of life than that. And, um, and so I knew it was time to do something about my health. And I had had, you know, some success with low carb in the past. I had bought that Atkins book back in the nineties when it was really popular so, um, you know, I gave it a try and it was like starting to work and I just rolled with it and I kept going and, um, and it was really working. And I, you know, I wasn't um, super curious about it back in the 90s, but I became really um, curious about why it was so successful and why it was working for me. And, you know, more than just like the weight loss, why it was giving me energy and helping my brain to heal and helping me to, uh, you know, have more focus and concentration and, um, and my allergies and everything reducing and all of that stuff getting better. Um, I wanted to know why that was. So then I really started, you know, diving in on YouTube, trying to find and every, um, you know, presentation, every uh, discussion by a doctor, whatever, to, to understand more about it. And, uh, you know, and that's kind of what began my interest. And like many people, I think in the early days, um, you know, people didn't, you know, people didn't come to carnivore like straight from the standard American diet. It, it was, you know, they kind of got there through keto. And so, you know, so I, like other people, you know, as I continued to learn, I saw people talking about the carnivore diet and I wanted to uh, know more about it. So I finally decided to, you know, full on, give it a full on try. And by day two, I knew this was how I was going to eat for the rest of my life. I mean, the level of energy and, you know, just how good I felt was dramatically improved, even over the dramatic improvements of keto. So, um, you know, so, so what began as like a 30 day experiment, you know, four years later, like I'm still going. <laughs> so, wow. So it's four years now. Mm hmm. And were you doing the whole kind of bulletproof thing? Because I think a lot, I mean, for me, I, I kind of came through that, that Dave Asprey sort of idea. Were you doing that around that time with the keto? No, I think I started keto a little bit before all that stuff happened. So we weren't even using the word keto back then. I mean, I knew about ketosis and I had like, you know, the urine strips that you pee on, but I didn't you know, there, there really wasn't that kind of language. There weren't those kinds of products or anything like that. I had heard about um, Dave Asprey later and, um, but, you know, like I was already on the keto journey. So there wasn't a need to kind of go back, back to some of the things that people were, you know, beginning with. 
So what what kind of what kind of problems were you still experiencing on, on keto? Were you did you have kind of any benchmarks that you were looking at, like a particular level of fatigue or, or weight loss or one of these things? How were you measuring this, and what what were you still experiencing then? Well, on keto, I lost weight, so you know that didn't end up being an obstacle. But I still had allergies. I still had asthma. Um, I, you know, I still had eczema and, um, you know, I'm just a person like, you know, I'm allergic to everything. Right. And, uh, I, years later, my mom told me that when I was born, the doctors told her I was allergic to soy. So I've been allergic to soy my whole life and now understand that, you know, my consumption of any packaged product, you know, includes soy. I'm also allergic to corn. So, you know, it's everywhere. And, um, so I've struggled with allergies, uh, sinus infections, um, you know, asthma, skin stuff all my life. And uh, I didn't even think that those were things that were really going to go away with keto. I mean, I'd heard about people having their allergies go away and I'd hoped that that would be me, but it wasn't. So, you know, I just kind of was like, okay, you know, that's just me. Um, but then, you know, I heard people talking about carnivore kind of as a way to, you know, to lose more weight. And so I was like, well, let me try that. And, you know, that didn't happen, but like a million other incredible things happened. So it was like, okay, you know, so when I went carnivore and took out dairy, my asthma went away completely. And at the beginning, when I first started carnivore, my asthma was like, actually at the worst point it had ever been, um, that month. Uh, I started in December of 2017, and in January of 2018, I went to urgent care twice um, because I just couldn't breathe, and, uh, you know, I had to get a nebulizer, and, you know, they threw all of these steroids at me and all that, that kind of stuff, but, you know, and then I went to, uh, like, a pulmonologist and was formally um, uh, diagnosed with um, allergy-induced uh, asthma. So basically my allergies was what was causing my asthma. Mm. And, um, and so, you know, once I took out the dairy, like all of that stopped, I haven't used my inhaler in years. I still, you know, keep a, an emergency inhaler, um, you know, the fast acting one just in case, but, uh, you know, but I haven't had to, to deal with that at all, which is unbelievable. And then like my skin has gotten, dramatically better. Now, eczema is, um, you know, something that runs in my family. And uh, I think when I, you know, I'm a person who does strict carnivore. I don't know that everybody needs to be super strict about it. So, um, you know, some people include coffee, herbs and spices, you know, olives, avocados, um, artificial sweeteners, and occasional vegetables, and, and, you know, and they're okay. I choose not to do that, um, partly because I don't really have a desire for it, but also when I took out spices, that really made a difference for me, for my skin. And um, so, you know, I, I think that um, there were definitely some benefits for me for being, you know, extra strict, but my skin got a lot better. And, and, um, and then, you know, I continued to have more energy, um, yeah, so those were some of the things, the benefits that came with uh, carnivore. I think greater mental acuity, all of that. It's weird, isn't it? I mean, I was asthmatic as a kid uh, quite badly, and I had a nebulizer and the whole thing and the steroids, like you say, and the eczema. And I've always struggled with dairy. Dairy's always been a problem. I mean, I, I've tried even recently, I've been doing over the last year, been doing some reintroductions and every time dairy, I so want it to work, but it just doesn't. And actually, you know what? I agree with you too about the spices. There seem to be one or two that are okay, but like most of the herbs are okay, but the spices, the moment you get into those powdered seeds and stuff, it just seems to go wrong, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I, you know, I didn't do a lot of like testing to see, you know, whether paprika versus thyme versus peppermint was okay. Um, I, I think that, um, you know, I just am looking for relief. And so once I found it, it was like, I'm fine, you know, and as far as I'm concerned, you know, salt makes meat taste great. And that's, that's enough for me. And, yeah. you know, I'm good enough there. 
Yeah. And are you, do you subscribe to any of the theories that say, well, actually, you know, we do need some small measure of this stuff. It is evolutionarily consistent. There aren't actually any historical examples of people living entirely without plants. How do you, how do you kind of square that stuff away for yourself? Well, I mean, I think that that might be, well, I mean, I think that the issue with carbs and, and these kinds of foods is that you know, some people are more resilient and they can, um, they can not be harmed by a small amount of poison and other people are less resilient and so can't deal with it. So I don't think it's a question of a, a amount, some amount being good for us. It's just some people are better at dealing with it. And maybe if I had grown up in an environment where I didn't need any of this stuff, um, by now I would be more resilient. And so I would be able to eat a little bit and not have a problem. But that's not the world I grew up in. You know, I spent decades being obese. Um, I smoked cigarettes, I drank alcohol, I ate a ton of sugar, ate tons of vegetable oils. So you know, my body has been damaged. And I don't know how long, you know, following carnivore, I might get to a point where I am healed, you know, by by it and am more resilient. But I don't think that I'm there yet. Yeah, I... I, I, I kind of agree with you. I, I mean, you know, my my um, background is the same, you know, eating junk, drinking, smoking, all those kinds of things. And then you you suddenly find that you sort of run out of room. And I don't I, I don't know that age is on our side with this. I don't think we're we may heal, but I don't know that we're suddenly going to become more and more resilient to those things. It seems like something that drops off. And I've heard it explained as an evolutionary thing, like you, you needed to be able to tolerate things up to reproductive age. But after that, you know, all bets were off. And so there's not necessarily an evolutionary pressure to have a long-term tolerance to these kinds of things. Yeah, I, I think that's a great point. In, in my early life, I was getting a PhD in anthropology. So I was always interested in evolution. And sexual selection is, you know, one of these theories that, um, you know, talks about like the, uh, you know, behaviors that, um, you know, are selected for in order for you to be able to reproduce. But once you get past, you know, reproductive age, or if you're in the older end of reproductive age, there isn't, you know, there's no impetus for mother nature to keep us alive. So at that point, we're kind of on our own to figure out longevity and all that kind of stuff. So yeah, I, I think you're exactly right. But I think it's interesting now, isn't it? Because we actually have no we don't we don't really have any selective pressure anymore because if we do things that prevent us from having children we find ways around that medically there's very little you know and, and even the things we're doing that are harmful they don't tend to harm people until they hit that kind of 40 you know 40s sort of area so we have it's it, you could arguably say we, we almost don't have that selective pressure anymore yeah, I mean, I, you know, evolution, the power of evolution happens over eons. So right now is just a blip, you know, so who's to say that this, you know, 100 years that we drive ourselves into the ground is um, going to make a difference, or we are evolving ourselves to extinction. So <laughs> either one of those is a possible path. And uh, I don't know. And now I've adopted this lifestyle, but I don't have any kids. So I'm not helping at all. <laughs> But hopefully I can spread this information to other people who have the ability to, you know, pass on um, a better way. But mm -hmm. I do think, well, I mean, as far as, I don't know about the whole world, but as far as America is concerned, you know, we have um, eaten ourselves into the grave. And I don't see us being able to go many more generations like this, um, you know, without, without things turning around. These people are just you know, um, having a harder time having kids, having kids later, they're having a lot of health problems and people are dying early and our economy is, is you know, buckling under the weight of the, um, you know, the cost of the, uh, medical stuff. So I, I just don't see this as being um, sustainable longer than, you know, another one or two generations. So either way, it's going to collapse. I don't know how it's going to go, but <laughs> there you go. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. I think you're so right about that. It can't, it can't go. It's like a housing market that's going up and up. You, you can't just keep going forever. At some point, the, the bill has to be paid by somebody. Um, so, 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 okay. So talking about that, you, it would be wrong to say just because you, because you don't have children, it'd be wrong to say that you're not propagating this information. So, 
Um, you know, tell us about the people who come to see you. You know, who who comes to see A Day Fox and asks for help? What does this person look like, and what what are their needs and requirements? Yeah, so I, um, you know, I'm eager to help anybody who wants to, um, you know, to follow this way of eating and, and really wants to give it a try. It is a, a challenge, I think, in the beginning. Um, I mean, I think the food itself is delicious. Uh, but, you know, lifestyle, families, work obligations, all of that kind of stuff does make it more challenging. So I think that the person who wants to give this a try, you know, really has to be willing to commit to trying it fully for 30 days and not, you know, sort of giving up the first time it gets hard. So the person who comes to me is usually um, ready, you know, ready to make that commitment. They are, um, you know, either exhausted or, you know, just for whatever, whatever their why is, whatever their reason is, they are at the end of their tether and they're just ready to make a complete and total change and switch. And, um, and so it's really exciting to work with someone at that point, because I know, you know, I know how great they're going to feel on the other side, but, you know, nobody, nobody does until they actually do it. And so I, it's really, you know, fun for me to see someone who is struggling with sugar addiction, um, struggling to, you know, to, to have the energy to do their work, struggling to really be able to think clearly, starting to forget stuff. Um, you know, having a lot of physical aches and pains, having a lot of inflammation, you know, feet swelling at the end of the day, like, you know, those sorts of things, let alone, you know, being able to really think about doing much physical activity or exercise. So when that person gets going on this, you know, by two weeks in, there are already, you know, some pretty dramatic changes that happen. Um, you know, all the inflammation is gone. Aches and pains are gone. Um, you know, the three o'clock blues don't happen anymore. You know, they're totally alert and awake. I can see, you know, people's skin improving. Um, and, you know, I mean, getting tighter and younger looking as well, but just starting to glow from inside. Um, I can see people's moods. They look happier and more, you know, just more excited about life. Um, not everybody, but some people's vision improves. <laughs> so that's really awesome. You know, their glasses, they can put them away or um, don't have to use them anymore. And, and, um, and so those are the kinds of things that I see happen like in the first week or two. And then, um, you know, and then over time they get better and better at like being able to, um, you know, feel satisfied. So like, I think for, for many women, this is like the first time in their lives that they're not hungry, you know, or they're not battling hunger or battling cravings and really walk away from a meal feeling not stuffed, but fully satisfied. And, um, you know, I, don't, I, you know, before I started eating this way, I don't think I could remember a time when I felt that way, like where a meal just fully and completely satisfied everything. And I could walk away, like not, you know, not thinking about food and um, getting off of carbs and really filling up on nutrient dense food, making sure that you get enough protein and enough fat and that it's coming from animal sources. And, um, and that's going to bring a power that, you know, most people have not, not ever felt. Do you, so that's uh, who's coming to me. <laughs> do, do you, do you concern yourself at all with the biology that's going on here? Do you, do you, are you worried about, you know, in any way about why these things make such a positive difference? Or are you just like, no, look, this clearly works. The proof of the pudding is in the eating. That's the end point is them feeling better. They do feel better. So let's do this and not really think much more about it because it's hard. It's so, I mean, the, the kind of the understanding around this is so is sort of changing all the time. And it's quite, it's quite difficult to keep up. Do you, do you, do you bother? I do, uh, you know, just because I personally find it very interesting. Like I said, I studied anthropology and was always interested in, um, you know, human subsistence patterns. So I always wanted to know how did people eat, you know, through throughout history and throughout, you know, our prehistoric times. So, uh, you know, so I was sort of exposed to this idea of, um, you know, like paleo eating before we started talking about paleo. So, 
uh, it wasn't hard for me to kind of grasp that idea and kind of run with it. But, um, you know, but I did continue to, you know, try to understand the biology of it and understand what's happening in my body. And I think for me, that was very important because, you know, as I was trying to break the sugar addiction, you know, there's part of my brain that's like, what are you doing? You know, of course you need M&Ms. Like, what are you listening to these people for? Like, M&Ms are very important. It's okay. You can just have one. Just have one. And, you know, I needed to break down and understand what that voice was in my head and what it was saying and actually, um, you know, address it. So I, I really needed to dig into the biology of what was happening in my body and what was happening in my brain. And I think that's something that we don't really talk about as much, but keto and carnivore is doing as much, if not more work in your brain, in your physical structure of your brain to repair and heal as it is in your body. And um, a lot of what we think is, you know, a lot of people come to me and they're like, oh, I'm just greedy. That's, I just eat too much. I'm lazy. You know, I don't like to get up and exercise. And I'm like, no, there's actually biological reasons why that's happening. That's not a personality quirk of yours. You know, this is a biological thing. And once we remove those things, you won't want to eat those things. And you will want to get up and exercise, not because you should, but because you just like have all this energy and you feel like doing it. So, um, you know, so I, I think that uh, I am interested in the biology of it, but I think um, it is overwhelming for your average person who's not really into uh, into science like that. So I have tried to make my channel into a place where you can get this information in a way that is, you know, super easy, super bite-sized and, and inspiring. And that was why I started trying to interview, you know, just regular people who are doing carnivore and talk to them about how it's improved their lives and how they have fit it into their lives. And I wanted people to see real people. Um, you know, I mean, I think uh, influencers are great, but like, you know, the person who chooses to film themselves and put it out there in the world is already a unique and, a, and not a, your average normal person. So you're not getting um, a normal view of what carnivore could look like in a regular everyday person's life. So by trying to find that regular person and highlight their story and let everybody see it and let them see story after story after story, showing all the different things that carnivore has done for people, I hope that that will be inspiring and, um, and help people to decide, okay, this is something that I can try. It's a little crazy, but it's not so crazy that it's not worth trying. And, um, and there's somebody like me who has my disease, my problem, my thing, and it's helped them. So maybe it'll help me. Yeah, I think that's, it's exactly right. Do, do you, has your, has your opinion about uh, any particular things shifted over time in dealing with these people? I mean, you, you, you've got all this experience now of seeing a lot of different examples of this and, and, and there must be some unique things that stand out to you. Have you, how, how has your kind of understanding evolved? Maybe different horses for different courses, so to speak. I think in the beginning of when I started carnivore, I was doing a lot of biohacking. You know, I was listening to a lot of uh, um, videos and doctors and influencers who were talking about, you know, more fasting, less fasting, more fat, less fat, you know, uh, targeting this much protein, that much protein. And, um, you know, and all of that, I think, um, is fine if you're into that, but I think it creates a sense of, um, you know, it creates a sense of anxiety, like, I'm not doing this right, I'm doing something wrong, I've got to do something different. And, um, and it also creates a sense where you're not listening to your body. So, you know, no matter what formula, what, no matter what any doctor says, you know, your body knows what it's doing, you know, and if you listen to it, it will give you the signals as, as to how much fat it wants, how much protein it wants, how much water it wants, how much salt it wants, and how much of whatever it wants. You just have to identify, listen, identify the signals and respond to them. And so when I finally let go and started to, you know, to do that and stop, you know, trying to do all of these biohacking things, I got more comfortable with carnivore and it became, um, you know, sort of an easier thing to do and a more enjoyable thing to do. So, um, 
So what was the question? Like, what do I see? No, that, that's, that's great. I mean, that's a really interesting point is that we, um, you know, maybe we need to let those signals take over. But what what's really interesting to me about what you j just said is to, is to go from being a person who, you know, clearly was, was addicted to food. And anyone that says that that doesn't exist is, is just talking nonsense. But you were talking about the, you know, the little, the M&Ms and their little song that they sing in your ear. And, and then, and you're coming to this point where really you're, you're not then getting that same level of addiction to things that are really equally delicious. You know, you're making delicious burgers and steaks and stuff like that. And they're not singing that same song. And that's quite an interesting thing because, you know, uh, maybe there are some people who overeat on carnivore, you know, it is possible to do it, of course, but you're saying basically, you know, people, people have to, people have to stop trying sort of following a kind of mantra and and particularly i imagine if you're dealing with a lot of women with the fasting you know people who are not eating often enough particularly at certain points of their cycle maybe um you know you can let this take over and let it guide the process yeah and i think people just are not you know we're i mean we're, when we're not taught to trust ourselves and to you know we have um broken our commitments to ourselves. I mean, you know, everybody who has started on a Monday morning and is like, I'm not having a donut and then has it, you know, the, the donut does damage, but also that action of not doing what you said you were going to do, you know, breaks your trust in yourself a little bit. And you do that over and over again, and you get to the point where you just don't trust yourself at all. And I think this is part of the problem why people have trouble in the beginning when they start carnivore with their families. Their families are like, oh, here we go again. Another one of these uh, crazy diets, you know? Yeah, so, yeah sure, you're gonna do this, but uh, I'm still gonna order the pizza. Should I order extra for you? Because I know you're gonna come in and get it later and I don't want you to eat mine, you know? And so there's that definitely going on, but, um, I think it took a long time to let go of this idea of um, restricting and, and restricting either calories or portion size or amounts or, or anything and really just let the appetite rule. And, um, and that takes, you know, that takes time and that takes, you know, a willingness to rebuild trust in yourself. But I kind of decided, you know, I was tired of being at war with myself and, uh, or with my body, I should say. And I wanted to be, you know, in partnership <laughs> and trust that, you know, I don't know, you know, I have not gotten good information from the medical industry, from my doctors. Um, I, so I don't know, I don't know the answer, but I think that my body for, you know, the first time ever, my body is acting like it does, you know, it's sending me signals. I think while you're addicted to sugar, you can't do intuitive eating, you know, because the intu intuition is always going to say more M&Ms, more. Um, but once you break that addiction and you remove that, then you can start to listen and hear and you'll be surprised that your body's been telling you all along. You know, the sugar addiction, sugar clouds everything, you know, it's like a, it's like a drug and it sends off like a bomb in your brain. And so there's, you know, you can't really see um, all the emotional stuff that's going on underneath. But what I find is that when people, um, when we get off of sugar, then all of the um, ways that people use food to, uh, as an emotional management tool, um, you know, those things become clear and you can begin to work on those things, uh, you know, separately from like, you know, the use of the drug. So, um, so, it doesn't mean that all of your emotional stuff goes away. And in fact, this is something I often hear from people who are starting out, you know, on carnivore that like, they feel great, their mood is improved, they don't crave, um, you know, sugar. And, but then they just feel like, so sensitive, you know, like all of the world, the stresses, life, like they don't have any any of the tools they used to use, no alcohol, no food, you know, no ice cream, no, none of that. And they just have to deal with life on its own terms. And, um, and so some people really find that to be a challenge and it, and it is, you know, I mean, some of us never really learned emotional management tools as kids. And so, you know, we're playing catch up as adults and, 
you know, can be a lot. So if you're used to coming home and sitting, you know, on the couch with uh, ice cream and putting your feet up and watching TV for hours until it's time to go to bed, when you take all that away, you know, your crummy boss and crummy job hasn't gone away. So your emotional resilience might be better. So you can be happier and deal with it, but um, you still have to find better ways of dealing with it. So what, what would you suggest to somebody in that position? <laughs> I, you know, I'm still trying to figure all that out myself. I mean, you know, the basic things that I, that were, you know, that we hear about are in, um, you know, in self-help books. I mean, making connections with people, keeping a strong, uh, you know, network of friends and family and people that you can rely on and relate to, talk to people, you know, communicate with people. They say a problem shared is a problem halved. Um, some people find great solace in being uh, spiritual or going to church and stuff like that. Um, a physical exercise is a great way to burn off and get rid of like the physical manifestation of that stress because you know stress is like there are hormones that give you that feeling and to, to dissipate them you kind of have to do some physical exercise. Um, so you know so those are some of the things and then you know the thing that I always tell people is enjoy yourself like you have to give yourself comfort and joy um, you know, every day. So that means enjoy every meal. Don't ever make a meal that you don't like. Um, eat enough. You know, if you're hungry, it's going to be really hard to stick with this. And, um, you know, and and have pleasure. Like, the, you know, find hobbies, things that you enjoy and engage in them and give yourself, um, you know, permission to, like, to do those things and say no when you can. And I guess, you know, join the Black Carnival Facebook group where you're going to get some support and community. If you, if, because, because, Absolutely. As you say, why did I not say that? Yes. Yeah, why not? <laughs> yes. But, but I, but I get, but <laughs> I this know. is, this is interesting as well because what, what you said before about the family members, you know, people get, I mean, I see people get angry when people make these kinds yeah. of changes. They find it very threatening. So, what are some strategies that you can use? Say, for example, you know, you've got your family, you know, your your husband, say, for example, just just basically isn't supportive at all. Your children still want to eat fries every day. So how, how, do you, how does someone cope with this? What, what can you what can you do other than say, you bastards, you better be supportive? <laughs> what, what do you what, how, how can you tackle this? I mean, I think every, you know, family is different, um, but you got to have a conversation and um, people need to understand that this is your life you're talking about. You know, and the people that I'm talking to are, you know, older. So people are usually, um, you know, in their 40s and 50s and 60s. And, um, you know, and so when you start to get to that age, you know, it's more than just I want to lose a couple of pounds. It's like, you know, I want to get off these medications. Mm -hmm. I, you know, I'm starting to have these real life uh, illnesses that have very mm -hmm. real consequences. And so, um, you know, it is kind of about saying, hey, do you want me to live much longer? Because, th you know, that's really what we're talking about here. Um, but I, I actually had um, a, a guest on the um, podcast who said, um, you know, when it was finally time for her to like deal with her stuff, she said, I just had to get ruthless with my goals. And I was like, I love that sentence. You've got to be ruthless with your health, with your goals, because, you know, at the end of the day, only you are responsible for your body and, um, you know, no one else is. And people, I don't know that family, I mean, you know, you always think, you know, your family, your parents are going to live forever, which of course is not true. Um, so it's hard to really, as the outsider, to really sort of conceive of, you know, this being like that serious, but it is that serious. So sometimes you kind of have to have that conversation and you've got to, you know, say, this is what I'm doing. And also I think, you know, presenting it as this is what's happening. So um, if you have young children, obviously you still have to feed them. But, you know, if we're talking about people who've got kids, you know, 15 and up or husbands and, and adult people in the house, it's like, come on, you know, like, people can feed themselves and, you know, and yeah. you can, you can batch cook a roast 
you know, everybody likes it. Like, you know, you can make some sides that you leave off, but so you're not that, you know, you don't eat yourself, but you know, you make one big piece of meat that everybody eats. Like, you know, people can like pitch it, you know? So, um, and I don't know, to me, I find it a little bit surprising because when I was a kid, I loved beef. And then the more I could have had it, the better. So I, you know, if, (laughs) if somebody had said to me, okay, I'm only eating meat, and you can have some beef, I'd be like, great, I'm right there with you. You can forget about the rice. I don't even need that. So, um, yeah, so that's kind of the approach. But I, I think people do get threatened because they're like, oh, my God, you know, mom's going on another diet. So this means no more Oreos or I've got to hide the Oreos because, <laughs> you know, if I blink, she's going to eat the whole bag. Um, so I get that people get a little bit um, uh, upset. But usually all of that dissipates. And I even have one client who told me that like her mood has improved so much that now um, when she goes off, you know, her family's kind of like, hey, don't you want to have some steak? And mm. like, you're, <laughs> you're getting a little, uh, a little crazy here. So I think it's time to go back on your diet. So it's, it's that it can be that dramatic and that noticeable. And I think that, you know, families will come around. They will. Yeah, and I suppose it's it's it's, it's often about finding that point because it's not like you can just clear all the food out of the cupboards. Other people in the household still have to eat, and you know, so you have to find that that kind of peace with having that stuff around a little bit to some extent. Um, so, okay, let's have your top tips for someone looking to start on carnivore. Okay, um, let's see. Uh, one, make a list of all your favorite meat meat dishes and make those. Two, eat fatty sources of meat as much as as you can. So don't rely on butter to be your only fat source. Get fatty cuts of meat. Um, three, really commit and give yourself 30 days to full on do it without cheats and see what it feels like and then decide whether, you know, whether it's right for you. Later on, you can become less strict if you want, but do get real strict in the beginning. Um, let's see, four, get support. Join my Facebook group. Join the Facebook group. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And five, um, get coaching there. I don't often say that. So I do think that there are, um, you know, there's a lot of problems and challenges that people have in the beginning. And a lot of them are avoidable. You know, there are just things about people not choosing the right meats to have or, you know, not getting the electrolytes right. Not, you know, there's a, a bunch of things that behavioral things that, you know, it just having someone who's more experienced is saying, OK, this is what you're doing wrong. Um, that, you know, that can be really helpful. So I feel like getting that support in the very beginning can be super, super helpful. And especially if you're a person who's had trouble with consistency and, um, you know, and, and, um, staying on track for, you know, a longest period of time, like working with someone and being accountable and, um, you know, and having a level of, uh, commitment where you're talking about what you're doing. Um, and engaging with someone can be super helpful. And that's the, the kind of uh, program that I have where you get like that daily accountability and all of that. So uh, definitely, you know, do that. So that was five things. Yeah. Those are good. five great things, but I think that covers everything. Eat enough salt. Um, Eat enough that's salt. that place where people always fall down. Mm. And um, even if you think you're eating a ton, you probably could be having more. Yeah. If it's not so making you. If it's not making you feel nauseous, it's normally like that's the point when you've okay, you're having too much. Um, yeah. yeah, it's interesting. I find as well, people just don't they they take the portions of meat that they were eating before with full sides, and then they just take the sides away, and then they wonder why that it's like you need to eat more meat. You know, you need to replace those yeah, calories. Yeah um all right okay how about this you have to eat one meal forevermore describe it yeah hmm i i guess you know this is so unoriginal but i guess i would go with um the ribeye and sauteed scallops on the side Ooh, that that's not unoriginal sauteed scallops a little bit sweet nice crust on them 
Yeah, mm-hmm. difficult to cook though, easy to overcook. Yes, yes. Um, I, I did feel like I, I mastered that and, you know, and frying them in butter is uh, amazing. And um, yeah, that's just like a perfect combo for me. So your butter, yes, but other dairy, no. Is that how you, is that how you do things? You tolerate the butter okay? Yeah. So in the beginning, I cut out butter as well when I did cut out dairy. I mean, it was all of it. And then um, I made ghee. And uh, for those of you who don't know, make ghee. It is absolutely delicious. And, um, and don't buy it, make it. It's so easy to make. I have, that was the first video I posted on my YouTube channel. I do it in like 28 minutes on the stove top. It's super easy and it just smells and tastes delicious. So, um, you know, so make your own. And, uh, and then I used that in the beginning and I was sparing with it because I didn't want there to be a problem, but over time, you know, it didn't seem to be a problem. And then, um, over time I would introduce butter and it didn't seem to be a problem. So, uh, yeah, so I, I do have butter. So we'll put your ghee, uh, your ghee video link in the show notes so that people can find that. Oh, and, awesome. Um, that, that'd be good. Uh, so, uh, finally, what are your plans for Black Carnival? What do you, how, how do you see that, that, that brand, that entity developing? Are you going to just continue in the, in, in the, in the vein that you're running at the moment? Or have you got some other ideas for it? Yeah, well, I started it because I, you know, I'm particularly concerned about black and uh, health in the black community. Um, I, you know, I'm sure your listeners are aware that, um, well, diabetes and metabolic disease is, is certainly rampant in America, but it's even more so in the black community. And the outcomes from those diseases are even worse. So amputations are way higher in the black community, vision loss and, and stroke and all of the other consequences of, of metabolic disease. So, um, it, you know, in my opinion, like we, our community just does not do well with, um, you know, the carbs and, and the, um, you know, the processed foods that everybody is eating. And so um, I, I see that more and more people are choosing to go vegan. And I think, um, you know, partly that's because people are really sick and they go to their doctors and their doctors are like, you know, you gotta lose weight. How doc? I don't know. Good luck. Go figure something out. And so, um, you know, they think that vegan is healthy. So they try to do it. And, um, I think that, uh, I, I would like people to know that there's an alternative way that, um, you know, following a ketogenic diet and carnivore is a ketogenic diet that removes the, you know, the, the plant, um, the foods from the plant kingdom can allow you to have a level of healing and, um, you know, and, and strength that you might never have experienced before. And I would argue won't experience on a vegan diet. And, um, I just, I feel like somebody has got to be, um, sharing that information and creating a community that allows for, you know, for people, um, who, you know, have these health needs to have, um, you know, to have an alternative way of eating if they don't want to do the vegan diet or if that doesn't work for them. And, um, so my goal is to continue to grow the community, continue to, to grow the message, continue to teach people how to do this. And, you know, more and more, I think that carnivore is getting really popular and that's awesome. But then I see people doing it in really weird ways and they think that they're doing it right and it's totally wrong. Um, so I, I really am trying to get like good basic information out there so people can, um, start off on the right, right foot, even if they're not, you know, going to a coach or something. Um, so, uh, if you're trying to do this on chicken and fish, don't do that. You can't, <laughs> you've got to have some red meat. Uh, it doesn't have to be beef. It could be goat. It could be lamb. It could be bison, but you've got to have that every day. Um, it doesn't have to be every meal, but you have to have at least a serving every day. So, uh, yeah, that's, that's the, um, you know, it's a long-term goal and I'm trying to, um, you know, just get on as many podcasts, share, you know, share the message, share the stories. Uh, if you are a person who, who watching this has been following the carnivore diet and you've really been doing great and you want to showcase your story, um, I would love to do that because I am, you know, I'm really trying to get that message out there and I'm always excited to hear <clears throat> each and every person who said, you know, who's had ex- success. I'm always excited to hear about it and, um, and enjoy having those conversations. 
Well, I think uh, I can speak for the whole carnivore community and say that we're very, very lucky to have you doing that. And thank you for doing it. And um, thank you for coming and talking about it here. It's really been interesting. And I, I look forward always to seeing your content every day. Where can we find it? So you can find me uh, at Black Carnivore on Instagram, uh, Black Carnivore on YouTube. And um, I'm Ada Fox, it's spelled E-D-E-F-O-X on Facebook. And then there's the Facebook group, uh, Black Carnivore. Um, Clubhouse, I, I do have a Clubhouse room, but um, I think I might need to put it down for a while because I am over platform and, uh, you know, having trouble keeping up with all the content creation. So, um, yeah, so you can put that aside. And if you want to apply to work for me, you can go to blackcarnivore.com forward slash apply now. Brilliant. That's so cool. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for your time. It's been so interesting and always such a pleasure to chat with you. Thanks, Absolutely. Aiden. I really enjoyed it. And I'm sorry about all the noise and, you know, the, the crazy setup here. And I'm sweating because I'm in a room with no air conditioner and no air. But. There you the, go. There's the noise was the noise was non-existent at my end. Just my terrible internet connection, I think, was the main <laughs> hurdle. But it's I think your message has got through. It's very loud and clear, and we all really appreciate it. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks for your time. Thank you. That's it for now. Come and find me on Instagram at Rustin's Boneyard and at www.rustinsboneyard.com. Keep cooking.